Hi, everybody. Welcome to week four of Criminal Justice 201 Policing. I'm Professor Jason Ostro, and this week's lesson is Police Roles and Strategies. Let's get started. This lesson, we will describe various police roles, list and describe goals and objectives of policing, describe police discretion, and then explain community policing. And what I want to say before we move into the material is this is that a lot of controversy involving policing beyond the surface controversy of policing, like things like use of force, um, systemic misconduct, beyond those, a lot of controversy in policing is also originated from this idea of what we want the police to do. What is the role? And that philosophy differs from person to person, place to place, and time to time. And nobody's really right, nobody's really wrong in my view, because if one community says, we want this type of policing, and another community says we want that type of policing, who's to say that they're wrong? Now, we as a society have to make decisions about that too, but nonetheless, the role of the police does in fact cause a lot of controversy in policing. So, let's talk about that. Police roles. Some people feel that the police role should be to fight crime, and as you see from that picture over there, it looks like a very aggressive use of police force. And some people might look at that and say, that's what I want to see the police doing, arresting people, assuming the person needed to be arrested in such a manner. Other people may look at the police and say, I want them to engage in order maintenance, just to make sure that everything is okay, just to make sure, just to be out and about, just to make sure that you know, the, the streets are orderly, that traffic is orderly, that pedestrians are crossing at the crosswalk, that everybody feels safe and secure. Order maintenance. Others may say that we think the police should be service providers and providing services that are not available elsewhere. This is an interesting picture here, and uh, for a number of reasons. It's pretty, it's pretty well known from a few years ago. This is a young officer in the NYPD who was somewhere in the village, and uh, he came across this uh, individual who appeared to be homeless and without shoes, and he ended up going and purchasing a pair of shoes for the, this individual and uh, you know, out of his own pocket. And somebody saw this on camera, and uh, somebody saw this, and they caught it on camera. And, um, you know, made the police department look very, very good. They had a big press conference. And uh, they actually ended up making him a detective after this, uh, incidentally enough. And so many people said, wow, that's great. You know, look, police work going out there and helping people, providing services. And that was certainly a nice thing to do. Question is, is it the responsibility of the police to do such a thing? And in the idea of defunding the police, one of the arguments that's made is maybe they do too much. And uh, often you hear, maybe they shouldn't be interacting with homeless people. Maybe they shouldn't be going through domestic violence. Maybe they shouldn't be interacting with individuals who are, who are in mental health crises. And maybe those people are right, and maybe they're not. I don't know. But what I do know is that what you have here is sort of a graying of the role of the police when you say they're there to provide services. What services are they there to provide? Now, if this person is in mental health distress, and if this person is homeless, well, then there are services available to that person. And it's not necessarily from the police. Anyway, it's something to think about. Uh, investigations, right? So, uh, pre uh, pre you know, the preliminary investigations as well as uh, post-event investigations, most people would say, yes, that's an absolutely a role for the police. What about this? Anti-terrorism. This is something that you didn't really see pre-9-11. And in the uh, 21st century policing, post-9-11 world, um, this is something that you see that is more and more common. You know, police donning military gear, and equipment and taking on this sort of anti-terrorist role, particularly in the 10 to 15 years after 9-11, and then, you know, it's, it continues too. Uh, and then last but not least, we have this idea of police role is just simply a role model, you know, for young children and for uh, society in general. When you think about Robert Peel's idea about what the police role is and what the police should do, you know, he even said in his nine principles, and, and I'm paraphrasing, to, you know, to select individuals based off of their high ideals and their reputation, you know, well, this idea of a role model. So what role do we want in the police? And that depends on who you ask, when you ask, and where you ask. One of the things that we can mostly all agree on in the world of policing, and, and I would say this is uh, fairly standard, is that the primary goal of policing is and should always be, first and foremost, to protect life, right? Life and then property, life and property. Okay, primary goals. And uh, that's you know what the police go out and try and do every single day. The secondary goals of policing are different, right? To prevent crime, to prevent terrorism, 
prosecute offenders, recover property, enforcing regulations, right, delivering services. So all of these, assisting the sick and injured, secondary goals, uh, we can argue about uh, which one should be you know, more important than others. I, I, I think in the world of policing, it's uh, you know the gold standard uh, primary function of all police is to protect life, number one, first and foremost, right? Okay. So um, we get into this idea of what's known as policing styles, and this comes from James Q. Wilson, who is a uh, famous political scientist, or rather was a famous political scientist, and uh, but he wrote about criminal justice, and he wrote a lot about policing, and um, he's famous for you know a number of writings, um, but the most probably the one he's he's most famous for is uh, you know, being the co-author of Broken Windows Theory. But uh, he also authored uh, some material about policing and thinking about crime. And he wrote um, about uh, different styles of policing. And uh, you know, these styles of policing can vary between police officer to police officer, as well as police organization to organization, right? So like you have the watchman style, primarily concerned with order maintenance, you know, just controlling disruptive behavior and illegal and unlawful behavior, just controlling it, right? Watchman. Right. And then one of the pictures that I showed you earlier, early order maintenance, right? just you know, maintaining order. The other style is legalistic, letter of the law. Police are out there to enforce the letter of the law, right? Whatever the law says, that's what they, that's what they do. They are oath is to the Constitution, and they are sworn to uphold the laws of the state of New York or the city of New York, or wherever it is that they are, you know, whoever's employing them. Legalistic style. This is against the law, and go out and enforce it. And then there's the service style, serving the needs of the uh, community. So you can think of like a watchman style as, again, order maintenance. You can think of legalistic as almost like zero tolerance. And then you can think of service style as like, you know, really more along the lines of problem-oriented and community-oriented policing. And police departments vary in their, their own, you know, orientation around this, as well as individual officers. And that's dictated by politics, by time by communities, by discretion, individual choice, officer's choice. And what I can say is, even here in New York City, we've gone through, you know, different variations of these styles within the police department over, you know, the last 20, 30 years. You know, when policing in the 1990s was very, you know, zero tolerance oriented for the most part. And you've seen more of a you know, switch over over the last 10 years to this watchman style and even more service orientation. So something to think about is which is most effective? And uh, it's a tough question to answer. All right, so this leads into the idea of police discretion, which is extremely important. And it's probably the most important thing in the criminal justice system, and here's why. Because police have to make choices. Choices, police departments make choices about what to enforce. Police officers make choices about how to handle specific situations. And then you think of it like a domino, you know, like a row of dominoes. The police are the first domino in the criminal justice process. And if they, like, use discretion and decide not to enforce something, well, then that person never existed. Whereas if they go and they pull somebody over and they give them, a, give them a summons or they place them under arrest, that domino now falls and the rest of the criminal justice process initiates, you know. So... Discretion is an availability of choices, options, or actions that you know one can take in a situation and based off of somebody's own professional judgment. Criminal justice system uses discretion, uh, tremendous amounts of discretion. A prosecutor uses discretion, courts use discretion. But I, again, I would argue that police discretion is the most important and it's because um, it's the difference between entering into the criminal justice system and the criminal justice process and not having existed at all. Police officer again pulls you over and they just say, Okay, I'm gonna let you go with the warning. They use discretion. You never existed in the criminal justice system. Whereas if they give you a summons or they place you under arrest, now that initiates the rest of the process. Okay, so how is discretion uh, exercised? Choices between when to arrest and when not to arrest. When to conduct a stop question or frisk. When is it reasonable? What type of force to use? How much? Right? The use of deadly force, right? It's the ultimate form of discretion. When to write a summons or when to just warn and admonish. What kind of crime to investigate and when not to take a report for certain types of offenses. Enforcing, enforcing certain laws and not others. And you might say, well, can the police do that? And they, they have to do that because there are, there are so many things that are against the law that if they, in fact, enforced everything, 
then everybody would be in violation of something, whether it's crossing the street against the light or riding your bike on the sidewalk or you know, or or using a uh, uh, sitting on a milk crate is against the law. I mean, you name it. So they have to make decisions about what to enforce. And both the organization makes that choice and then also the individuals make those choices. So what influences it, right? So the offense, what, what are the characteristics of the offense? Typically, if it's a felony, the police have no choice. If the, felony, if the offense is, involves a felony, they involve no choice. If it's a misdemeanor, typically they do have some kind of discretion, and if it's a violation, usually the officer themselves has, has a lot of violate, a lot of uh, discretion. Relationship between the victim and the criminal, right? Are they family members? Are they friends? Are they neighbors? Do they know each other, right? Two people get into an argument on the street, and uh, the police show up, and these two people don't know each other. The cops can say, listen, just you go that way, and you go that way, and let's call it a day, all right? And that's discretion. But if those two people know each other, they're neighbors. Their relatives, well, that's a different story because there's a likelihood that violence may occur in the future. So relationship between the police and the criminal was the person arrested in the past, right? And then also, what does the police department require? If the police department says zero tolerance, you know, zero tolerance, you must enforce all of these laws, well, then officers are required to carry that out, okay? All right, so just let's look at these two brief scenarios, and they're, they're pretty straightforward, but and it gets you to think about this concept of discretion. A police officer stops a person who jumps over a turnstile. Subway. Person has ID. But instead of issuing a summons, the, 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 the officer places the person under arrest because the person's being mouthing off, they're being a jerk. Right? That's discretion. A police officer jumping over a turnstile is theft of service. So a police officer can just say, you know, I'm going to give you a warning, but go ahead. Police officer could say, I'm going to give you a summons. Police officer could also say, I'm going to place you under arrest. Discretion, choices. In the law, as well as by policy, they can do that. And so that's a use of discretion right there. All right, scenario number two. A man is stopped by a security at a drugstore for attempting to steal candy. The police are called to the store. The store manager demands that the person be arrested. And it was worth, you know, $5 worth of candy. Now. An officer may show up and say, all right, listen, let's, uh, how about we just tell this guy never to come back to the store again. He'll sign an agreement, and then if he comes back, we'll arrest him for trespass. Pretty reasonable. However, sometimes police departments say, all shoplifters must be arrested. And that's called zero tolerance. And in the 1990s and the early 2000s, that was very common. Okay, so it's individual discretion sometimes is limited by the organization. Okay, and they're also sometimes limited by the law. So this is a really important slide here. How is discretion controlled? Sometimes discretion is controlled by laws. Like laws, certain laws require that the police must arrest, especially those involving domestic violence. Okay, the police must arrest if it's a felony or if it's a domestic violence misdemeanor. Laws control when the police can use deadly physical force when when they when they're justified. When uh, they can stop question and frisk versus Terry v. Ohio. Police department policies say when they could shoot, when they can't shoot, when they must arrest, when there's zero tolerance. And then individual officers make the choice sometimes when those first two, when laws don't apply and policies don't apply, then it comes down to the individual officer. All right? And your assignment this week, the discussion board assignment, relates specifically to this slide. So if you, um, you know, you say, Professor, uh, I don't understand the question, and I don't understand how to answer the question. It's because you didn't look at the slide. And because I'm asking you about when it's controlled by law, discretion is controlled by law, when is it controlled by policy, and then when is it individual choice. Okay. All right. One example of department-wide discretion is, is community policing, which is very popular today. It's a choice. When I became a police officer in the late 1990s, Police departments were still very zero tolerance, broken windows oriented, you know, enforcement of low level offenses. That story about a candy bar, somebody being arrested for a candy bar, is a true story because it happened to me. I wasn't the person getting arrested, but I was the person that was required to arrest somebody else for shoplifting. I didn't like it, but it's what I was required to do because uh, the department policy said all 1012s, security holding ones, shoplifters, must be arrested 
when there's probable cause. So, must. Not may, not can, not should, not think about it, but must. And if I fail to do that, then that's official misconduct. Okay, so uh, police departments have moved away from that. They've moved, uh, you know, many police departments have moved away from the zero tolerance because of lowering crime rates and the blowback from the community into this idea of community policing. This really started in the 1970s, but didn't really take off until really the, you know, the, probably the mid 2000s, you know, um, and it's very popular today. So community policing is a choice by, um, first and foremost, it's a choice by police departments to engage in, 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 you know, it's a philosophy of empowering citizens to develop a partnership and to work together, to have the officers seen as members of the community, not necessarily an occupying force, meaning not seen like as people who just come and go from the community and, uh, you know, they commute in, they work and then they leave, you know, but to see uh, them as being really embedded in part of the community. There's a very important reading that you have on your uh, blackboard this week on community policing and it's a required reading. So make sure you get into it, but it's pretty good. All right, so some of the ideas that community policing are, you know, long-term problem solving, right? To reduce violence, reduce civil unrest, eliminate police brutality. I mean, I think we could all agree with these are important things, right? Uh, to involve the police in, I'm sorry, to involve the community um, in uh, decision-making process about how they're going to be policed. That's important in our system. That's why we have 18,000 law enforcement agencies because, you know, policing is a very localized thing. And then you want to have like a individual officer who you can rely on and say, oh, I know Officer Jones, you know, I have a problem. Maybe Officer Jones can help me out. He's my neighborhood community police officer. Bringing back the beat cop, right? The beat officer, Robert Peel. That's what Robert Peel was talking about. And then, you know, using like these uh, foot posts, high visibility, like get cops out of cars, you know, this idea of community policing. This also is related to this idea of problem-oriented policing, which came about in the 1970s. Herman Goldstein was the, the big proponent of uh, problem-oriented policing, and uh, you know he tried to look at traditional policing as incident-driven, meaning like something happens and then the police respond. Something happens, a call for help goes out, the police respond. So like let's get ahead of the problem, right? This is problem-oriented or problem-solving policing, as it's called. It attempts to find underlying issues, like why, you know, do we keep getting these types of 911 calls in this neighborhood? Like, what are the underlying issues? What's the larger problem? Let's identify the problem. Let's come up with solutions. And so that's why it's problem-oriented or problem-solving. Uh, it's a component of, uh, of community policing, but they're not exactly the same. The difference is uh, problem-oriented policing is police-focused meaning the police come up with the solutions, they identify the problems, come up with the solutions, whereas community-oriented policing is more community-focused, like the, they work to, they, you know, they work in tandem, right? Um, and also problem-solving policing uses this, this decision-making model, problem-solving model, you can call it the SARA model, S-A-R-A, -A, which stands for scan the environment, what, identify what the problem is, analyze that problem, Right? And then you know, develop a response to that problem and then assess. And it's a continuous, it's a continuous loop that you do, you know, problem after problem after problem, the sour model. Okay. All right. So that's it for this particular lesson in terms of the lecture component, but uh, you have to read that uh, community policing literature that's uh, embedded in Blackboard. Very important. Uh, there's also a video, and I think you'll find it really interesting and, and quite inspiring, actually. Um, this is what community policing looks like. You get to see what, um, you know, a dedicated um, community-oriented police officer, you know, what they do and what it means to them to be, uh, you know, a police officer. So it's uh, quite inspiring. Um, you also have a discussion board, which will be due, the initial part will be due by Thursday. The response will be due by Sunday. Again, hint, hint, hint. It's about discretion. So uh, make sure you take, go back and take a look at the discretion, um, you know, different levels of discretion. So if you email me and you say, Professor, I don't know what you're talking about. It's because you didn't watch this entire video. All right, anyway, but uh, I'm not gonna play gotcha. Just do your best. And then last but not least, prepare for quiz number one. You'll have three questions, right? There'll be three essay questions next week and it'll be on weeks zero, one, two, well, we gotta do zero. So uh, week one, week two, week three, and week four, you'll have four questions. I'm sorry, three questions. They'll be short answer essay. Uh, so make sure that you prepare. Okay. All right. I wish you all the best of luck this week with uh, everything as well as these assignments, and I will see you online.